in reference to the X factor, which which pertains to Teddy Newton, there was Teddy was working on sequences, and and we would give him assignments to say we want you to work on this section here, where uh, for example, where uh, Ken is buttering Hogarth up. You know, he's trying to get friendly with him. So Teddy would come back with a sequence, and it would be it would be wild. Teddy Newton, I don't even know how you sum up Teddy Newton. <laughs> he's a uh, kind of a free-range talent. I, I don't know. You, you, you corral him at your own peril. What we found was is that Teddy, because he was just completely free in his thinking, would come upon these gems that we would never have thought of in a million years, and uh, that's where that's where we coined that name. That Teddy's the X factor. I think we started with the idea of Teddy was going to do this, and then as we learned more about Teddy, we just kind of let him go in all these different areas of the film and, and uh, he did a lot of great stuff and I think Teddy is great. I don't know if I fully understand him though. I'm Teddy Newton and this is the Iron Giant story reel. This is Hogarth's mother Annie kind of sizing herself up for the date and she sees she's got kind of you know some problems here and she decides that maybe she can you know spruce herself up a bit she gets the makeup on, and so she gets real glamorous. She's uh, supposed to go out on a date with Dean. She hears a, a doorbell, and she calls for Hogarth. He walks over to the door, and he uh, opens the door, and there's Dean. And the boy says, are you here to pick up my mother? And he, and he kind of quietly takes a drag off his cigarette and blows it in the kid's face, and it all clears, and the boy says, wow, you're cool. And so mom comes down, and it's obviously a blind date. She doesn't know what to make of this guy. And he snaps his fingers and walks out the door. And the kid just says, hey, isn't he cool? Why don't, why don't you get going? Uh, I don't need no babysitter or anything. And so outside, we see you know, the car's revving up. He's making a real big racket with the car. And the neighbors are plugging their ears. And she's really embarrassed. And she gets into the car. But he kind of rips off the line. And they're going about 80 in a residential neighborhood over here. And so she panics and she, she notices the amber light and grips him real quick and he pushes her away, takes a drag, then downshifts it and really floors it and thinks he'll go for it. He's headed straight for this crossing truck and they go straight under the truck and hightail it to Canada. And they go up to uh, Big John's Moose Meat where they're going to eat dinner and they, you know, he throws out the money, the guy throws out the steaks, she catches it. He shifts it again and then they rip off the line and they pass through the toll booth and uh, on the way back, he uh, goes to the junkyard where he lives and he gets the little remote out and he kind of clicks it and sends the signal up to the junkyard, which activates this kind of Rube Goldberg device. The ball falls, hits the bellows, the knife slices open the cat food, the cat food drops. The cat on a wire starts eating the cat food, then gets heavy, the line gets pulled, it burns the cord, the anvil then falls. Uh, awaking these two dogs with a balloon pop and they open the doors to Dean's junkyard and uh, the two drive right on in. Anyway, he breaks and then he snaps his fingers and directs her where to go. And it's this lovely scene and she kind of thinks that's really nice, this Lincoln Town car that's been converted and uh, this buzzing noise is heard off and he's cutting the meat we see and he brings the propane and starts uh, cutting, uh, cooking. He says she's a vegetarian and uh, this really confuses him. So he, the only way, you know, she, she feels apologetic about, you know, what she said, but uh, he, he, the only way Dean kind of knows how to express himself is through, is through uh, violence. And so he throws the, the dinner across the room and, and she panics and then he kind of storms off pouting like that and she sees if he's okay. And he's, uh, kind of crying by the oil barrel there, he even lost his shoe, and she says, it's okay, it's okay, which, what, and he says, don't, don't, don't talk to me, I don't want to, I want you to look at me in this state, and so he says, she says, listen, it's okay, uh, uh, listen, Dean, it was cute what you did with the meat, and he says, no, it's not, it was dumb, and so she says, well, how am I supposed to kiss you with snot running down your nose like that, and he says, really, you mean you'd kiss a guy like me? So then later in the day, he starts saying, all I've really been wanting to do is create a sense of fantasy in my art. See this one here, I call this Sorrow's Crown. And she says, wow, that's great. That's great stuff, Dean. That's wonderful. Really, you really think so? Yeah, I do. I, I, I think, you know, I don't see this stuff just laying around some junkyard. I see this at the Guggenheim, at the Met, maybe one day on the surface of the moon. And he says, wow, 
that's so sweet of you to say. No, it's not, it's true. You just lack self-confidence. Anyway, so the whole night, they start to talk and, and they get a little closer and we see that all the uh, big front that he's put on is just kind of an insecurity. And uh, I showed Brad this scene and uh, I think that's when I was actually pulled right off the story crew. <laughs>